Nagapan Anamale. He began his course of study at the Mohammad Satak School of Architecture Symposium. He then went on to pursue his higher education at Bharat Institute, where he also conducted his research, Zonasa. He went on to conduct workshops at TCE Madurai on tsunami resistant structures. He is currently heading an architecture and interiors consultancy, Kalpa Viriksha, since June 2014. He has had eight years of experience in design, execution, and project management of architectural and interior projects. He has worked on many residential, commercial, hospitality, industrial projects in India and Singapore before setting up his own practice. He has also presented technical papers at various national level symposiums. He is also known to be a national champion at Arkhamen and Arkhamen Pro, India's biggest architectural quiz. Welcome to the UGC lecture series on architecture, building services 3, unit 5 acoustics, lecture 10. The contents of today's lecture are as follows. The fundamentals of acoustics, we will look at the definitions of sound waves, frequency, intensity, wavelength, measure of sound, decibel scale, speech and music frequencies and reverberation time. We will also look into the acoustics and building design. We will see how should one do a site selection, then what are the what is the impact of the shape and volume of a space with regard to acoustics. And finally, we will also look into the treatment for interior services for best acoustical performance. Let us define acoustics first. Acoustics is usually very broadly defined as the science of sound. For this lecture, we will concentrate on the room acoustics. So, the shaping and equipping of an enclosed space to obtain the best possible conditions for faithful hearing of wanted sound and the direction and the reduction of unwanted sound. So, this is called the room acoustics. Room acoustics deal primarily with the control of sound which originates within a single enclosure rather than its transmission between rooms. So, what is a sound wave? A sound wave is the pattern of disturbance caused by the movement of energy travelling through a medium. It may be air, water or any other liquid or solid matter as it propagates away from the source of sound. The source is some object that causes a vibration such as a ringing telephone or a person's vocal cords. There is an analogy or comparison to the movement of water in a ripple with the movement of sound waves. So, the pattern of the disturbance creates outward movement similar to a ripple in a wave pattern like waves of sea water on the ocean. The wave carries a sound energy through the medium usually in all directions and less intensely as it moves farther from the source. Next we come to the definition of frequency. Frequency is defined as the vibration cycles per second and it is usually expressed in hertz. And the wavelength is defined as the distance between identical points on a wave. As you see in this graphic, the wave has a certain pattern. And then the wavelength is measured between when the same pattern repeats again. So, that is the distance between identical points, so identical patterns on a wave. Next comes sound magnitude. So, in sound magnitude, we have two aspects one is the sound power or acoustic power, the next aspect is sound intensity or acoustic intensity. The sound power is the rate at which sound energy is emitted, reflected, transmitted or received per unit time and the SI unit of sound power is watts. So, you would have seen people denoting the speaker capacity, the speaker volume as in watts, 500 watts, 1000 watts. So, this is what they mean by the watt, the sound power of that particular speaker. When it comes sound intensity, it is defined as the sound power per unit area and the SI unit of sound intensity is watt per meter squared. The sound energy passing per second through a unit area held perpendicular to the direction of propagation of sound waves is called intensity of sound. Next is the measure of sound. So, the sound is measured using a unit called decibel. The decibel is a logarithmic unit used to express the ratio of two values of a physical quantity, often power or intensity. So one of these two values is often a standard reference value in which case 
the decibel is used to express the level of the other value relative to this reference. So, one is a constant value, the other is expressed as a, as a relative effect. So, while power is measured in watts, the most used acoustic measurement for intensity is the decibel and where the name decibel comes from is it is named in honor of Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. A decibel is equivalent to 1 by 10th of a bell. So, that is that is why the word deci, deci denotes 1 by 10th. So, deci bell is decibel. A decibel is a logarithmic measurement that reflects the tremendous range of sound intensity our ears can perceive and closely correlates to the physiology of our ears and our perception of loudness. So, here there is a graph or the decibel scale which shows this green line which is a threshold of hearing which means the smallest or the minimum sound level which a human ear can perceive or hear and on the red line shows a threshold of pain that is a maximum sound one can hear and after which it causes a pain in the ears human ears and all the music and speech happens between this two threshold limits of hearing and pain. Now, we move on to sound pressure level. The sound pressure is once again this, this is a relative thing as we see in the early saw so in the earlier graph it also has a threshold of hearing up to this threshold of pain. So, here graphically they have shown various activities various objects emitting sound and which are the sounds which is in the threshold of hearing and certain sounds which go up to the threshold of pain. And here we have shown a picture of a, a noise isolating headphones which is usually used in construction sites in order to prevent this threshold of pain affecting the workers. So, from the previous definitions we understood that sound is transparent in terms of waves and it needs a object which vibrates and further transfers or transmits the sound to a distance. So, here in this graphic chart you can see a source for example, maybe a guitar an object this is a vibrating object and the vibration variables are as follows they are like the conductor they are the rate of vibration the number and relative energy of harmonic vibrations and the total energy of vibrations. This in turn the resulting wave characteristics from the conductor demands this velocity the rate of vibration decides the frequency the number and relative energy of harmonic waves decides the wave shape and the total energy of vibration decides the pressure of sound and in turn this velocity and frequency put together decides the wave length of sound and when it comes to the perceptions of the ear this frequency decides the pitch at which we hear the sound the wave shape decides the or is the reason for the timber or quality of sound and the pressure uh, translates into the amplitude of sound and based on the pitch and timber we identify the tone of a particular instrument or a human voice and this is the path or a flow chart which shows the mobility of sound in a step by step manner. So, first it, it is created as a physical disturbance from the sound source then it turns into pressure waves a compression and rarefaction waves and then when it hits the conductor or the vibrating medium it at times is transmitted to the human ear as a direct sound from the vibrating medium in the space in the air or the volume of the room it it attracts or it changes as reflections resonance it becomes a reverberation then it becomes a diffusion it gets diffracted it becomes diffraction and finally absorption and then it reaches the human ear. So, it goes through all these aspects in a particular space. So, let us define reverberation now. A reverberation or reverb is created when a sound or signal is reflected causing a large number of reflections to build up and then decay as the sound is absorbed by the surfaces of objects in the space which could include furniture and people etcetera. The time interval between reflections is usually so short that the distinct echoes are not heard instead this series of reflections will blend with the direct sound to add depth. So, reverberation is a basic acoustic property of a room it can enrich speech and music in all areas or it can slur speech and generate higher noise levels throughout a room depending upon the room volume timing and absorption capacity. So, this picture talks briefly about 
the various parameters or aspects which define the acoustics of that space. So, this is a picture of a concert hall where you see a performance on stage, then audience seated on the seating and then the roof profile. So, here the roof materials, the fall ceiling materials, acoustic materials play a very major role in improving the acoustic performance of this particular space. Then the next would be the shape of the space itself, shape of the fall ceiling, the shape, the profile or the plan of the space. Then the entire volume also has a very great impact. So, what happens when a performer is performing on stage and the sound is, it, it starts transmitted from the stage. Sometimes it goes as a direct sound and the sound also gets reflected and then gets absorbed by the audience. As I mentioned in the earlier picture, the shape of a space determines the sound path within a space. So, in the earlier picture we had a convex type of a ceiling which reflected the sound. Here you see another profile, a concave profile. Here this convex profile reflects the sound into different directions and it distributes the sound whereas, a concave profile concentrates the sound in a particular point. And here you see another graphic or a picture showing a, a rectangular room or a squarish room where which, which has parallel wall surfaces and parallel reflective surfaces generates unwanted reverberation. So, it is better to avoid such kind of a shape in when uh, designing buildings like concert halls and auditoriums. And now comes reverberation. So, reverberation as we had defined earlier is the multiple reflections from the various points of the space and then later absorption by the audience, by the furniture, whatever objects in the room and finally, the decay of sound. So, here there is a direct sound from the performer, then there are multiple reflections from the roof and then finally, it reaches the audience. So, once we have defined reverberation, the next important aspect we have is reverberation time. So, the reverberation time must match the room function. Pure speech requires short reverberation time. Symphony blends notes with long reverberation time. Here we have a graphic showing the different reverberation times depending on the volume of the room. So, here there is a band, a red band. This the y axis is the reverberation time in seconds and x axis is the volume of room in cubic feet. So, the lower part of the band is the best for rooms intended primarily for speech which means lower reverberation time. The upper part is better for music rooms, this is the upper part. So, studies based on audibility of speech and music reveal that most desirable reverberation times generally fall within the ranges shown below. These values are based on a sound frequency of 500 hertz which is nothing but the approximate pitch of a male speech. So, for speech like small offices, classrooms, lecture rooms and work rooms, the reverberation time range in seconds is between 0.5 seconds to maximum of 2 seconds. For music performances, the range of reverberation time is from 0.8 to 2.25 seconds depending on the intended use of that room. This reverberation time plays a crucial role in the quality of music and the ability to understand speech in a given space. When the room surfaces are highly reflective, sound continues to reflect or reverberate. The effect of this condition is described as a live space with a long reverberation time. A high reverberation time will cause a build up of the noise level in a space. So, it is difficult to choose an optimum reverberation time in a multifunction space as different uses require different reverberation times. Now, let us look at the requirements for speech. So, the aim here is to is for a good speech intelligibility at all seats within the space such that each spoken syllable is heard separately and not blurred together and that the speaker is loud enough to be heard without strain. The sound heard by an auditor is a blend of direct sound straight to the seat, early reflections from the walls and ceiling and the reverberant sound which results from multiple longer term reflections within the say space. Here the direct sound is a function of the distance between the speaker and the seat and will be louder when the distance is reduced. The reverberant sound has been traditionally measured in terms of the time it takes for the sound to fall by 60 dB to 1 millionth of its initial value. So, this time period is usually independent of speaker seat distance. 
depending instead on the volume of the space and the sound absorbing properties of its surfaces and contents. It also varies with frequency. So, when you if you read this last point and you can relate with the earlier picture which I had shown. So, irrespective of the speaker seat distance, the factors or parameters like the volume of the space, the sound absorbing properties of the materials you use in the space like your fall ceiling, your wall paneling, your flooring, the seats in the auditorium etcetera. All these decide the reverberation time and the clarity of a particular speech or music and research shows that the reverberation time of around 1.1 seconds at mid frequencies is appropriate for speech in small to medium spaces and that the reverberation time should not rise too much at low frequencies as is lowest intelligibility of by an effect known as masking. With good early reflections this figure becomes more flexible. An audience's expectation regarding the actual quality of the speech signal is usually not too critical as long as the speaker's voice and accent are clearly recognizable and any vocal information is understandable. Now, let us look at the requirements for music. What is the definition is a prerequisite for speech with music we expect more blend with the separate bursts of sound. On the contrary to music speech has only a one particular frequency or a single person talking. But here when it comes to music performance it has a people singing, it has a lot of music instruments playing and all those things. That is why they say it is it we people expect more blend with a separate burst of sound. So, people expect excessive clarity ok. Excessive clarity in music auditoria gives the subjective impression of brittleness or dryness and accentuates unwanted bowing or fret noise making the musician's job even more difficult. And one immediate conclusion from this is that rooms for music will be accept, expected to have longer reverberation times than rooms for speech naturally. And reverberation times up to 2.4 seconds occur in large concert halls and a value of 2 seconds is typical in recent work. The currently accepted optimum range is 1.8 to maximum of 2.2 seconds reverberation time. Another difference is that music can consist of a great range of frequencies starting from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz while speech is basically a narrow band signal which is between 500 to 4 kilohertz. Next we move on to site selection for best acoustical performance. So, how do we select a site for a particular building for say for example, a space for an office room or a space for an auditorium whatever. The basic understanding the basic criteria which decides is this we have to separate or zone the spaces accordingly or locate the site based on surrounding factors. For example, say for example, if you have a noisy road or a highway and then you are going to select a site nearby that you have to see how you can mask the sound or create barriers man made or natural barriers to reduce the impact of the noise affecting the space. So, here we have shown a small graphic there is a noisy space as a quiet space and you create a artificial barrier and within the building itself within the campus itself you zone the spaces as noisier space then non critical areas then you bring the critical areas. So, you have to consider acoustical sensitivity of activities. Here are a few graphics which show how you can do the site selection. You have to take maximum advantage of the distance from the source of noise. You can create natural or man made berms which acts as sound barriers. You can create man made artificial acoustical barriers. You can if it is a big campus you can place buildings which act as, bu which act as buffer between your the space where acoustical performance is happening and the noisier noise source. It is also best to locate buildings at a higher elevation than the noise source. Next comes orientation. Say for example, we have a site nearby the highway or the main road and the shape or orientation of the building with respect to the highway has a very great impact on the acoustical performance or the noise control within the site. So, these are very self explanatory graphics which can be understood based on the shape of the building how the acoustical performance happens. When it comes to campus planning you can orient your buildings or create some buffer spaces. So, that the noise from the main road or the noise source 
does not affect your activity. Say for example, if you take a school abutting a main road or highway, you can put a huge open space like a playground which will take care of noise transfer. Similarly, in a factory, a parking lot can take care of the noise from the road and it can it will not affect the office spaces. Next comes the shape, the shape of the room or the space. Let us look in detail about the shape, taking the auditorium shape or auditorium design as an example. So, for more than uh, 2500 years, the historical development of the theatre interior has been marked by the close functional relationship of these structures within their users needs. So, natural acoustics has always been a characteristic feature of these buildings. It is still important today when most of the halls are equipped with loudspeaker systems often computer controlled. The first shape we take into consideration is the rectangular shape. So, halls with rectangular plan have side walls that ensure short first reflection times, but the large parallel surfaces often reflect in acoustic defects such as flutter echoes and standing waves. So, it is not advisable to go in for a rectangular plan especially for an auditorium. Next is the fan shape. So, halls with a fan shape plan make it possible to accommodate a larger audience while providing good visibility and acoustics. The shape of the hall prevents the formation of flutter echo by side walls though the sound reflected from the rear wall can reach the front of the auditorium with a significant delay. This can be prevented by covering the rear wall with a sound diffusing or absorbing structure. The next shape is a horseshoe shape, horseshoe plan. It ensures once again ensures good visibility, a sense of proximity to the sound source and mutual eye contact between the spectators. A large number of boxes and rich interior decor contribute to sound dispersion which conceals possible acoustic defects and ensures the proper ratio of direct to reverberated sound. The large number of listeners and the presence of boxes can result in excessive attenuation of the hall thus preventing recommended reverberation time from being attained. Next parameter is the volume. Here there is a section of auditorium showing the the seating arrangement, the balcony position, the balcony heights and the reflection from the or the from the sound source the from the speakers and then reflection from the fall ceiling and the surfaces. So, classic auditorium is shaped to convert harmful late reflections into helpful early reflections and reverberation. When it comes to design of a balcony, it is important the depth of the balcony is always lesser than the height of the balcony. Why this is? You should have keep the opening height greater than the overhead depth. People at the rear of the under balcony need to be able to see the ceiling above the front of the stage. That is why we have to do this. And the balcony itself, people at the rear seats of the balcony need to be able to see the first and first six rows of the seats on the main floor. So, people on the balcony should see the first six rows of the main row. And the distance from the balcony face to the ceiling, ceiling should be greater than the balcony face to the rear row of the balcony. Next, we come into the treatment of interior surfaces. Basically, there are three types of surfaces. One is the floor surface, wall surface and ceiling surface. Usually, we use wood or concrete as the default material to construct floors. The wall, of course, we can use a lot of panels, we can use fabric covering, we can use curtains as treatments. For the ceiling, we can use baffles and clouds. So, what is baffles and clouds? These are nothing but the profile or type of acoustical paneling or fall ceiling done in concert halls and auditoriums. Baffles, uh, an example for baffles is shown here. Baffles, nothing but strips of acoustic panels hang, which is hanging from the ceiling. This is re really helpful for greater reverberation times. And we can also use fall ceiling like clouds with a mixture of a flat fall ceiling and some hanging fall ceilings covered with acoustic fabrics or panels. And the treatment also uh, encompasses the occupancy of the space like number of people on the seats. So, with this we have come to the end of this lecture. The learning outcomes from this lecture are as follows. We have learned the fundamentals of sound of acoustics which encompass the sound waves, the frequency, intensity, wavelength, the measure of sound, the decibel scale the speech and music frequencies and the reverberation time. With regard to acoustics and building design, we looked at the parameters of site selection, 
then how the shape and volume of a space affects the acoustic properties and how to treat the interior surfaces. The questions for this lecture are as follows, define frequency and wavelength, explain the design parameters for speech and music frequencies, what is reverberation time, what are the factors to be considered during site selection, how does shape and volume of a space affect the acoustic qualities. Thank you.